This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight at the Blue Building. This is a live Reason Speakeasy event in New York. And tonight we, or more specifically, I am talking to Jennifer Burns, a historian whose new book is Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. Please give a warm welcome to Jennifer Burns. Thank you. Thank you, New York. I'm going to do all my talks in New York. This is so awesome. Thanks for coming out. It is uh, oddly a city that Milton Friedman really didn't hang out in all that much, right? He was missing out. Uh, He was missing out. Chicago, Chicago is what, it's not even the second city anymore. It's the third city. And then he went to San Francisco, even further down the list. You know, he did spend time in New York, actually. It's a little known fact. Uh, We all think of him as a Chicago school economist. His PhD is actually from Columbia. Columbia is practically Connecticut. Right? So, all right. No, point well taken. And he, and he worked here a bit before and after World War II. We'll probably yeah, get Yeah, he into had that. a whole East Coast life. He had a, a New York world. He spent time in Vermont, New Hampshire. And, of uh, course, he was forged in the steely cauldron of New Jersey. That's right. right. Suburban New the Jersey. Greatest, Only the strong survive. Yeah, the greatest <laughs> state in, in all the union. Um, let's start by talking about uh, why, uh, why Milton Friedman? Why did you write a biography of Milton Friedman? So um, it wasn't part of a plan. It really grew out of my first book, which was a biography of Ayn Rand. And once the, the goddess, goddess, of, goddess the of the market, mm-hmm. Ayn Rand and the American right, another person who had a real New York history, although she loved New York more than than Friedman. So, um, I, you know, I finished that project. I didn't really know what I was going to do next. And I was doing a variety of different um, inquiries. I was looking into kind of a concept history of the idea of neoliberalism. It was the sort of first moment. This was a buzzword. What is neoliberalism? I was thinking of writing a broader synthetic history of conservatism, conservative ideas. I felt like I had maybe a third of the story based on Ayn Rand and the research I had done. And I was thinking of Rand as really a bottom-up figure. You know, nobody anointed her. Nobody said, read her, listen to her. Actually, they all said the opposite, yet she found her people. She found her audience. So Friedman, I thought of as very different, kind of top-down, elite, credentialed. And eventually I realized whichever one of these projects I did, I had to wrestle with Milton Friedman. And so once I started to do that, I kind of had the biographical itch again. All five <laughs> foot one of him, right? That's right. You have to with um, what, what is it about, you know, what's the essence of Friedman for you? Um, you know, what, if, if you have to sum up his life or, you know, what he inspires in you, uh, what is that? So um, I think Friedman is a really is the best example of thinking about how market principles and ideas can be taken outside of the field of economics and applied more broadly. I think he probably does that more broadly than I would, but nonetheless, I think he shows that real power of sort of abstract thought and analysis and the way that um, once you take something out of the context, the intellectual context in which it grows, it can have all kinds of you know, unintended consequences and can also be very powerful. Where did that come from? I mean, he grew up, he was, was he the child of immigrants or the grandchild of immigrants? He was the child of immigrants. So, um, his, and he's growing up Jewish in mostly up, in Rahway or near yeah, Rahway, New Yeah, so Jersey. he grew up Jewsy, uh, Jewish in Rahway, New Jersey. So small town America, very different than most Jewish immigrants. They landed in New York. They landed in Chicago. They had a really urban, um, more collective experience and, and lived in these Jewish ethnic communities. And he had, uh, there were about 10 Jewish families in Rahway, New Jersey. So he's really immersed in that kind of broader angle. Protestant culture. And I would say his parents were successful, but they weren't exceptional in an, any way that would make you think sort of they would, you know, give birth to Milton Friedman. Although I have to say he had three older sisters. And as I was looking through their high school records, I realized one of his sisters was actually ranked higher than him and like won more awards. So it's clearly a very distinguished family. Um, and I think that there was this kind of drive to know the world, to explain it. And it got really supercharged by the experience of the Great Depression. 
I think without the Great Depression, he may have been more focused on mathematics or kind of a more technical field, but he came to believe it was just one, like, why are people so poor? Like, what just happened? You know, this is, he graduates in, from college in 1932, and that's what really changes his focus to economics. And then we have to understand the 1930s as well. There's this huge economic crisis in the United States. It's not just in the United States. It's enveloping all of Europe. There's also the rise of totalitarian governments. There's the rise of murderous anti-Semitism. There's all these crises in the world. So it is a time to go back to what are the first principles? What are the fundamentals? What are the ideas we need to get ourselves out of this predicament? Can you, he, undergrad, he went to Rutgers and he encountered a couple people there who kind of shaped his life. Then he went to Chicago, is that right? That's right, And yeah. then Columbia is where yes. he got his PhD. Can you walk through, you know, a lot of people in his situation going to college and, you know, during or graduating into the Depression would have been like, well, what we need is an antidote to capitalism. Capitalism has failed. He took a very different lesson from that. That really, from the beginning, put him at odds with the kind of consensus. Who were the people who helped him develop you know, a, a countercultural set of ideas. Yeah. So um, at Rutgers, it, he actually, his first economics class, he didn't even like think was interesting at all. Um, he doesn't mention it at all. It's on his transcript. He doesn't mention it at all. He became inspired to go into the field by Arthur Burns, who becomes this like lifelong relationship, and Homer Jones. And they both pointed him to Chicago. What's really distinctive about Chicago, and I didn't, didn't know this when I began the research, I thought I would get to Chicago, uh, you know, I'm going through the archives and trying to understand what is the intellectual world into which Milton Friedman landed. And I thought it was going to be laissez-faire economics, like this is a market correction, it'll eventually solve itself. And I found something very different. I found his professors um, banding together and they created something called the Chicago Plan, which called for very significant interventions in the banking system. Um, it called for really elaborate federal relief or very substantive federal relief. About, I don't know, 90% of the Chicago plan is eventually enacted in the 1935 Banking Act. But if they had had their way, they would have gone even further. They had this pet idea of 100% money, which basically means no fractional reserve, fractional reserve banking they would have completely revolutionized the banking system. And so these are Freeman's professors. And I was like, wait a second, am I not studying the Chicago School of Economics? So I really had to kind of reset and think, what's going on here? So, so to answer that question, what did Friedman get? He got a set of ideas about the importance of markets, the importance of limited government, the, the importance of what they call liberalism at the time. Yet they also got people who were very committed to responding to the social conditions and the economic crisis around him. So from the beginning, he thought of these ideas as very dynamic and is tied to political advocacy and political change. So that's like one piece of the puzzle. The other is that he was immersed in the Chicago tradition of monetary economics. And so the monetary perspective, again, pointed to banks, it pointed to the financial system. And it gave you a way to think about kind of aggregate economic activity that sometimes we think, well, that really only happened with Keynesianism. But if you're thinking about money, you're thinking more systemically. So he had an explanation that was basically we have problems. We have a liquidity crisis. We have problems in the banking sector. We know what this is. As he'll later argue, we have some institutions that have made it worse. But it's not like a phase transition in the economy. It's not a sign of secular stagnation. Um, so so he, had a, he had another explanation. And what's interesting is that the economists that were like maybe just two to three years older than him, who became the, the really the sort of lions of liberal economics and of Keynesian economics, they got there just a little bit later when the new explanation on the ground was Keynesianism. So Friedman was just that little bit older where he came in, he got the monetary explanation, and that was really all he needed. Can you explain briefly what his read on the depression was. So it, it wasn't that capitalism was broken, it needs to be replaced wholesale. It's that, you know, something has gummed up the machine. Yeah. So, what was that? So it's interesting because he's, I can see from his notes and his thinking that he already has this idea that inflation is a monetary phenomenon in the 1940s. I mean, I, I see him writing this, this, you know, famous statement he makes in the 70s, we associate with the 70s. He's got it very early but he's still trying to work out like what does it look like? And so 
that will be the basis of the book he writes with Anna Schwartz. And so that's another New York connection because mm-hmm. yep. Schwartz is here toiling away at the National Bureau of Economic Research um, and doing most of the research and the analysis. And they will eventually come up with this broader framework of monetarism, but what really makes the book so famous and, and really catches people's attention is this reinterpretation of the Great Depression. And they, they have a chapter where they call it the Great Contraction. And so the idea they argue is they put together all these figures of Schwartz has literally gone to the vaults and gone to the books. And when she can't find the numbers, she like pesters the bankers, like help me get the numbers and adds it all up. And they step back and they say, uh, we lost one third of the money in circulation during the Great Depression. That's why it was so bad. The, the money was destroyed as the banks went under. Yeah, where did it go? It disappeared because in fractional reserve banking, the bank takes your deposit and then it creates more money by lending against that. And as we've seen from recent bank runs, it works because of trust because everyone doesn't want their money all at once. If you want your money all at once, it's not there. It's like a weird kind of psychological, you have to you have to trust just at the moment when you're least likely to right. trust. And, and this is, there's the famous scene in It's a Wonderful Life, which I think is from 1939 or there, or no, maybe a little bit later, um, but where there's a bank run. Yeah. And the, the, so we have to remember there's no FDIC. And this is one of the reforms that comes in in 1935. And it's the type of thing his professors are calling for because it really fundamentally undermines trust in the system. If you work hard, save your money, put it in a bank, and then it disappears. I mean, that that's just devastating. So so he believes that this is a system-wide crisis, and he and Schwartz start homing in on the Federal Reserve, which is created, I think it goes into operation in 1914. So it's new. It's not that, um, it's not that established of an institution. And, and they say, wait a second, the Federal Reserve system was created for this problem to support banks, to intervene in a liquidity crisis, it didn't do that. So it stepped back and it just watched it happen. So it turns out that the people that I thought were the Chicago economists who would say, oh, just let the market go down, it'll correct itself, it'll come back up. Those people were at the Fed. They weren't (laughs) professors of economics, but that was a very basic approach in the banking world. You know, it's, oh, it's a correction and we shouldn't, it would be moral hazard. They didn't use the term moral hazard, but it would be, um, it would be wrong to help out a bank that's weak because that's its own fault. Um, you know, the insight has to do with the, the money supply and that the Fed, or, you know, that money disappeared and the Fed contracted the money supply at the time they should have been loosening things up. There's that insight, but then there's also the method that, um, uh, that Friedman and Anna Schwartz focused on, which really was empirical. How odd was that for an economist to be really, you know, uh, looking at facts rather than theory? So one reason you know the empirical stuff was out of fashion was because Anna Schwartz was doing it, right? They they wouldn't have let her do anything that was particularly cutting edge. It was like, okay, fine, you can go add up these numbers. And this actually comes out of Friedman's first series of jobs. He he got his first jobs on the federal government during the New Deal when there was a great effort to measure um, both the crisis and the programs and just the general population. Like, okay, if we have a consumption problem, people can't buy what they need. How much do they need? How much do they typically make? And so the New Deal agencies were you know doing this type of work, but this was not what professional economists were doing, especially after World War II. They moved much more to math, mathematical techniques, general equilibrium models, bigger partial equilibrium models, just, just models and abstractions that would show you how the whole fits together. And they would be feeding in a few variables like the interest rate or the federal budget or the multiplier, the Keynesian multiplier. And it, meanwhile, Friedman was because he had this connection to this woman's world of consumption economics, like immersed in this data. And so um, it was terribly unfashionable. Money was terribly unfashionable, which is like such a strange thing to say. But because of the experience of the Great Depression, people believe that the, the Federal Reserve was really powerless. And so Freeman and Schwartz end up arguing it could have done. Yes, it was powerless, but that was because it made mistakes, not because it lacked 
power, not because money was a meaningless veil over more important forces. Um, to focus a little bit on that issue of consumption. Friedman, in an interesting way, was kind of doing woman's work, right? Where yes. Consumption was some. this was home economics, like what do people buy, et cetera. And Anna Schwartz is part of that, as well as his wife, Rose, uh, director was her maiden name, and she had a master's in economics, and she also worked in similar fields. Um, what 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 was gained by looking at consumption data rather than these grand theories? So yeah, I'll say this is another thing I didn't expect to find was the number of women who worked closely with Friedman, who collaborated with him formally or informally in all of his major publications and basically all of his major scientific work. I was very surprised to find that. And I think what that did is it brought in this just set of, of really empirical data and understanding kind of how people made spending decisions that you could lose track of um, if you were taking the more theoretical approach, which seemed more important. So one of the kind of outputs of this is a theory of the consumption function um, in which Friedman ends up arguing for the theory of permanent income, which is still a concept that economists use today. And that came out of these women that he knew. Uh, they were mostly friends of Rose's and they were studying um, farm income. And this was Dorothy Brady, Rose's best friend, and Margaret Reed, who would eventually become Chicago's only woman professor, tenured woman professor in that era. And they were trying to figure out, like, you know, a farmer, if you buy a, fact, a tractor, you spend a lot of money this year, but you don't spend that the other year. Or if you have a really good harvest, you get a... So how would you make sense of these ups and downs? And so they ended up, and then looking at what um, the farmers actually did, ended up concluding, they, they sort of naturally smoothed it. They, they anticipated what their permanent income would be over the course of their life. And they kind of smoothed it out. And now this was important because it ended up really putting pressure on the idea of the Keynesian consumption function, which had a very, um, had this idea there was a very clear relationship between consumption, income and consumption. And if you had that very clear relationship, you could measure the multiplier, you could understand the impact of a stimulus program, um, you could design more stimulus programs. And what Friedman's immersion in the data showed, and, and really these women kind of brought this finding to him and he theorized it, was that's not really true. Like it depends, there's many other factors at work that predict how much people will spend their money. So it just, it clouded this, the Keynesian paradigm that had been very clear cut previous to that. He, um, er, one of his early very influential essays talked about economics as a positive science. And it's, can you ex explain that? And was that a, almost a uniquely American response to kind of European theory? I mean, is it pragmatics or empiricism versus? Yeah, this is the methodology of positive economics, which, you know, sometimes gets analyzed in terms of the, the basic gist is what is the test of a theory? A theory is only good insofar as it predicts what will happen in the real world. And so you can, this does come out of conversations with Karl Popper. Um, it's It's been taken up as a kind of methodology of science or in these uh, uh, debates on the history of science. But what I discovered is it was actually incubated in Friedman's battle with the Coles Commission, which was a group of European emigres, many trained in physics or math, who were um, in the Coles Foundation for Economic Research at the University of Chicago. And this was basically a parallel economics department, and they, they kind of had joint appointments, and they were the modelers, and they were also very much politically left. It didn't have to necessarily be the case, so there, there's some lineup between doing a model that tells you what the policy should be and endorsing an activist policy. Anyhow, Friedman just didn't like these guys at all, and they, believe me, did not like him. Um, they were just like, you know, uh, oil and water. So these guys were more on the left. Friedman was more conservative. They wanted to do these big models. Friedman was like very suspicious of that. And what made it really difficult was that Friedman was very talented as a mathematician and actually had written several really important papers in statistical economics. So they sort of knew he could do what they were doing, and he was choosing not to. Let me go back to that essay. That essay, if you read it in light of this conflict with Coles, is a methodological argument against abstraction in economics. Was that influential 
Uh, yes, over time it was. And I think it actually, I found some economists talking like in the 80s and 90s, and they would they would kind of simplify it to, well, assumptions don't matter. All that matters is that we can predict. Friedman proved assumptions don't matter. Um, and that's really not what he was, the, the, the overall message. I think it was more about you have to test your theories against empirical data from the real world. But what he was able to say is that sometimes you make very unrealistic assumptions. So one would be this assumption of rationality. It doesn't matter if you think it's unrealistic that people individually are rational. It matters if you combine them all and you look from 30,000 feet up at the aggregate, they act as if they're rational. And that's enough to go on. So it has been hugely influential, but maybe in it's been interpreted in its own set of ways. Uh, let's Before we go on to some of his other insights and kind of policy positions or thoughts that really have major influence on you know the world we're living in now, let's talk a little bit more about monetarism. As um, you know, what is the theory of monetarism, as kind of simply put as possible? Uh, I could do it in two words: mm. money matters. She also the name of one of his last major book. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mischief. Money mischief. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, money matters goes back to this idea that money is not a veil; it it has active force in the economy, um, and. So that just became kind of his push for um, looking at looking at money historically and in the moment, but but also monetarism grows up in opposition to Keynesianism, and so the idea being, what is the what is the way to underwrite economic growth? With in the Keynesian synthesis, economic growth requires a more activist federal government, and it specifically requires the taxing and spending powers of the federal government to be strategically deployed to enhance economic growth. And monetarism is an alternative that says, no, economic growth comes from private economic actors um, who will generate plenty of um, ideas, initiatives, innovations, if left alone, but they need a steady monetary environment. If, you, if the price level goes up and down or fluctuates too much, those private economic actors retrench. They hold their money. They don't know how to make investments or plan. And ultimately, inflation, which is the big volatility in all of this, is always and everywhere a monetary, a monetary phenomenon. phenomenon. Not, it's not about taxation or you know government programs. A wage price spiral or a monopoly. And so, um, yeah, that, that becomes an essential part of the story. And then in the 60s and especially the 70s, monetarism ultimately, I mean, he's been kind of honing this theory for decades, and then the time is right for his explanation of what's going on. Can you talk a little bit about how what started to happen in the late 60s and the 70s couldn't be explained very well by kind of Keynesian or, or consensus economics, and people were looking for an alternative explanation, which he seemed to provide. Yeah, so let me say two things. The other core of monetarism, besides money matters, is what Freeman called like the K percent rule, that you should pick a percentage, and he said 4%, and that's what the, the money supply should grow at this 4% rate. And then that would provide enough room for the economy to grow, but people would know this is sort of what I can count on. But also that it's it's set, right? It's kind of like- It's a it's, rule. Yeah. It's very important. And that's another piece of the Chicago tradition, rules over discretion. We can also think about, this is almost a Hayekian idea mm -hmm. that you create the framework for competition, the rule of law, stable institutions, and then you let kind of yeah. activity Rules, unfold. Rules, not men, right? Right. It's, yeah. So it's all, it, it, all, it all really kind of has a philosophical symmetry under the surface. So the other thing that's challenging, though, is they call it the paradox of monetary policy. When it's done right, you don't notice it. It's only when it's done wrong that you notice it. So it's sort of, it's, it's a hard thing to get anyone to care about because you don't get a, you, you know, if you're a politician, you have a good monetary policy, nobody really notices. They do notice when you have a bad monetary policy. So if Freeman first made his name analyzing deflation, which was the great contraction, you know, he really has a, the, 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 the move into more influence is in inflation, the kind of flip side. And so you know, throughout the 60s, 
as I said, he's really hated by like the Kennedy Council of Economic Advisors. They're just like, oh, with this guy Friedman, like go away, like shut up and go away because, you know, they have a tax cut or they have a stimulus and they're like, oh, the economy is responding really well. Now Friedman will pop up in Congress and say, oh, yes, that was that monetary expansion um, that then with a the long and variable lag has led to an economic expansion. And they're like, you know, there's a quote from Walter Heller. He's like, so what? We're just playing fiscal tiddlywinks in Washington. They feel very diminished by Friedman. So at any rate, in 1960, But they, they could ignore him, too. They can ignore him. Because one of the things you point out, which is really hard to kind of understand, that after World War II, there was generally, you know, the economy was in pretty good shape. There was steady growth, not too much unemployment, not too much inflation. Things were stable. So then Friedman is constantly carping about mo money and it's kind of like why don't you just shut up exactly like what you know he seems like a doomsayer sort of like a, a prophet without uh without honor so but eventually this doomsaying comes to seem really relevant so in in 1967 he makes this famous speech at the american economic association and he the sort of idea previously is like we don't really need to worry about inflation um, and even inflation can be good because a little bit of a price rise means like things are really humming and generally there'll be lower unemployment when there's a little bit more inflation. And so it's kind of a trade-off. And Friedman says, you know, this trade-off, it might work in the short run, but it's not going to work in the long run because it's theoretically possible. And he goes on to explain how that you have a rising price level and then eventually you have rising unemployment because of all the ill effects of inflation and uncertainty. And so, and then he's, then he looks at the monetary data and says, you know, it's in front of, you know, 200, 500 economists, um, based on what the Fed has been doing, we're going to be heading into an inflationary period. So he just like makes this prediction and, and everyone thinks it's novel, it's arresting, here's this provocateur, they don't agree with it. And then in the early 1970s, because of the combination of Vietnam War spending, social spending, and a very loose monetary policy, that inflation starts to emerge. And so you have these economists who are kind of, they have their models and they're running the numbers and they're saying, oh, Friedman's wrong, oh, Friedman's wrong. And then they're like, well, he could be a little bit right. And eventually they're like, by gum, he's right. And it really, um, that long run, that trade-off disappears over the long run, as he said, in this more inflationary environment. Can you, uh, in the book, you do a fantastic job of painting the various characters. And you've mentioned Arthur Burns, who at this point was Friedman's professor and friend, and then became the head of the Federal Reserve under Richard Nixon. Um, and they come to a kind of dead end, right? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah. you know, what so, does that say about the way Friedman kind of operates intellectually and politically? So um, I guess I'll start by saying I'm not related to Arthur Burns. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I would say Arthur Burns is not um, just a professor. He's not just a friend. He is this sort of model of, of how to be in the world. Friedman calls him a surrogate father. So Friedman loses his father in, uh, I think, his senior year of high school. And it's not long after that he meets Arthur Burns. And as we talked about, his family is sort of a typical immigrant family. He doesn't really have a, a role model. And he sees Arthur Burns, professor at Rutgers, also from a Jewish immigrant family, and just says, wow. So, and so, who has waspified himself. He's become yes. fully kind of presentable in elite culture. Yes. And he ends up having, especially when their barriers, anti-Semitic barriers kind of drop in World War II, ends up, you know, he advises Eisenhower. He's a professor at Columbia. You know, he's head of the NBER. Um, and actually, a lot of what I know about Friedman and his life and that like one of the best sources for this book were the letters he would write to Arthur Burns because they're long letters throughout every step of his career because they're close but they're not physically close and they're also like kind of dear diary like he just writes like these very open-ended kind of musings and thoughts and personal stories to Arthur Burns so that's like the biographer's gold when you find a correspondence like that um, but then the correspondence really takes this sharp turn. Burns is appointed by Nixon, and everyone thinks, oh, it's now a Friedmanite Fed. You know, they're really going to be inflation hawks, money. Nobody's going to question if money matters. And Arthur Burns, it turns out, is not a monetarist. And he doesn't actually have a ton of really clear ideas about what the Fed should do. And he thinks that inflation is caused by 
you know, by wage price spirals. He's not really sure, but he doesn't really have a strong sense that the Fed is responsible for inflation. So he ends up advocating um, for what is called incomes policy. This is wage and price guidelines, which is like the first stage to wage and price controls, which he will also eventually support. And when Friedman, so apparently what happens, I know from this letter, you know, Freeman picks up the newspaper and he opens it and it says like Arthur Burns supports incomes policy. And he's like, what, you know, how can this be? And so I quote from some, it's, it's a letter. It's like the, it's almost like the end of a love affair letter. You know, he writes this letter to Burns. It's he gets, he tries to go to sleep. He can't sleep. He like wakes up in the middle and like, Arthur, how could you, you know, I feel betrayed. You know, it's this really intense letter. Um, and then even before Burns can write back, he sends another one because Friedman is the number one critic of the Fed. He's like the Ron Paul of his day. You know, he's just always criticizing the Fed. And all of a sudden people are like, well, Mr. Friedman, what do you think of what Arthur Burns has to say? And he's like, uh-oh, you know, <laughs> I have to really say what I think. Um, and to him, it's not an option that he prevaricate or trim or, you know, oh, Arthur's fine. Like, it's it's really obvious that he wouldn't agree with Arthur Burns, and he has to publicly disagree with him. And so it's very painful. And they resuscitate a friendship of sorts, but it's never the way it was. And he's also, by this point, uh, Friedman is writing in Newsweek, so he has, like, a very popular, very public uh, forum in which to bash his yes. mentor. Yes, right. So he's basically has to sort of publicly attack his best friend, in order to maintain his intellectual integrity and his reputation. Um, so it's not easy. Uh, and, and Burns is really not happy and the letters are quite frosty. It's interesting. Uh, the book has some pictures of Arthur Burns who really is old timey. I mean, Milton Friedman isn't mod. He didn't <laughs> become like a, you know, he wasn't wearing Nehru jackets in the sixties, but Burns looks like he's stuck in about Yeah, he had a pipe. He always wore, yeah. yeah, had a pipe. The pipe was a Fed chair thing. You got to have a pipe, at least back um, in the day. To kind of just close out the uh, story about monetarism, so, you know, the 70s are really volatile in terms of unemployment, in terms of inflation, in terms of what became known as stagflation. Towards the end of the 70s, um, Paul Volcker is named to the Fed, uh, head of the Fed, and especially under Reagan, he seems to be kind of doing monetarist policy at the Fed, but he's a reluctant person. And Friedman is kind of critic of him, even though he did, by most accounts, break the back of inflation. What did Volcker do, and why was it or was it not a kind of monetarist solution? Yeah, it's it's tricky. Um, so Volcker is definitely reading the, the monetarist literature. He's aware of the kind of... Um, revolution and ideas that Friedman is spearheading. And he does believe, like Friedman, that sort of over the long run, you can't trade off inflation and unemployment. He absolutely believes that. And he, and he believes that this is where they are now, that trade-off has broken down <clears throat> and inflation has <clears throat> created an environment that's that's really bad for everyone in the economy. Um, he's also interested in, so Friedman's technical idea is to watch the monetary aggregates, which are these specific measures of money that he and Schwartz have um, really sort of devised and popularized. And so Volcker announces that he's now going to target aggregates. So this is basically what everyone thought Arthur Burns would do, and Volcker announces he's going to do it. Now, it it turns out, I go into this in some detail in the book, and there's sort of a debate. Was Volcker kind of playing with aggregates because he really wanted to jack up interest rates? I tend to think he was genuine in thinking aggregates would work. It was, this was a reasonable assumption to make at that moment. And now it seems like it's not a reasonable assumption um, because the aggregates turned out to be very hard to control. And there's deregulation. I don't want to bog down in all the details, but Volcker sticks with it and eventually through the mechanism of very high interest rates um, is able to reset expectations around inflation, is able to really kind of change um, the economic piece. So the, the way that Volcker kind of is in the shadow of Friedman is one in realizing there is no long run trade off. And two, I haven't talked about Friedman's mechanism of inflation, but he suggests that expectations are a key part of the story. And so again, this is sometimes lost because now we're like, oh, inflationary expectations, like everybody knows this. This is why it's entrenched or transitory. 
this is like what Freeman puts on the table. It's not that nobody ever thought about it, but he says this is really the mechanism in which inflation accelerates once it gets going. And of course, the rational expectations will jump off of this. A whole field of economics will jump off this idea of expectation. So this is one of these Freeman ideas that it's hard to see because we just think this is how things are. This is like very natural thing, and but he's really the one who, who puts it forward. So all that being said, Friedman and Volcker do not like each other at all. They just don't get along. Volcker's really tall. Friedman's really short. You know, Volcker is like an establishment guy who will sort of work for any work for a Republican, work for a Democrat. And Friedman is like you know, more ideological and, you know, really only talks to and works with Republicans. And so um, and then Friedman is the academic who knows how his theory is going to work. And Volcker's more like, I got to try this. I got to try that. It's a complicated world. And so the result is that they, it's really hard. They, know, they won't give each other any credit whatsoever. We do know, though, that um, one person who did love Friedman was Ronald Reagan, who is the president when Volcker's interest rates are at 20 percent, you know, unemployment is spiking. And Ronald Reagan is getting a very consistent message from Milton Friedman, which is stick with it, do it now. You know, this is 1981, 1982. Things are going to be better by 1984. This is going to work. And so in that way, Friedman really does have Volcker's back in that he's helping to create the environment where there can be an independent, um, you know, federal reserve. Uh, controlling or, or affecting the money supply. And it is amazing, again, you know, we've had inflation and it's with us uh, today. But, I mean, when you look at how high interest rates were in 1980, 81, 82, and then they just really drop. Um, did and th did that help? Um, you know, it, did that the fact that Volcker seemed not to care? Right? So yeah, the, I mean, there's another piece of the puzzle, which is one thing Friedman was saying throughout the 60s and the 50s, which made people think he was just absolutely bats. He said interest rates are not a good guide to inflation or rather, interest rates are not a good guide to monetary policy. Interest rates don't tell you reliably if money is tight or money is loose. And this was like saying, like, the sky isn't blue. Because everyone was like, of course we know that we look at the interest rate to tell if money is tight or money is loose. And he's basically like, it's a lagging indicator. So it could actually, because we have a high interest rate, that could mean money was very loose. And he also said, eventually... Um, in a high, in an inflationary environment, that relationship is going to break down. So Volcker also recognizes this, that when you get inflation going, um, so prices are going up all the time, and in order to make any type of profit on your loan, your interest rate has to be higher than inflation. So if inflation is going up, interest rates are also going to go up. So then you actually have this total breakdown in the mechanism that's assumed, they're assumed to work contra you know, in in contradiction, but now they're working together. And this is also the concept of nominal and real interest rates. And the other thing that's really hard to recognize is the Federal Reserve does not distinguish between real and nominal interest rates prior to the Volcker era. Like they just don't think about it. And almost nobody else does because there hasn't been inflation. It's been a pretty steady state. And the interest rate is also regulated and fixed. So why would you think about this relationship? So Friedman, however, has gone with Anna Schwartz all the way back to 1867. He's just got a like bigger piece of history to work with. And so um, that's another one of these things that sounds totally crazy in 1964 and like super smart in 1974. Um, we are going to go to questions in a few minutes. Um, let's, I'm sure monetarism will come up in the questions, but... Uh, let's talk about some of the other big impacts that um, Friedman had. Um, he pioneered the idea of school vouchers, and he also talked about that in other contexts. But that seems to be one of his most um, kind of fertile legacies. We're living in a world now where more and more school districts, more and more states uh, and you know local districts are offering school vouchers. What was his plan, and how did that come into being? So... Um a couple things to say about that. One is I'm pretty sure he got it from John Stuart Mill because there's, there's a throwaway line in, on Liberty where he mentions that. And I know Friedman read that book as a graduate student. Um, and so 
let me just preface this with saying, you know, part of the Chicago inheritance is a belief in markets, but also a concern about inequality and a concern about when markets don't work and and those who are, are kind of left out. And so in the beginning of his career, Friedman's really advocating policies that are akin to a universal basic income. It's later reformulated as a negative income tax. Um, when he comes up with school vouchers, I think this is during capitalism and freedom when he's kind of doing what I said at the beginning. How can we take kind of market concepts, incentives, competition, and, and take them outside, you know, just sort of commodities markets maybe, or whatever would be the traditional object of economics. What happens over time, though, is Friedman shifts his focus from thinking the best solution to poverty and inequality is universal basic income. He shifts it to focusing on school choice. And in part, that's because the negative income tax is partially enacted. And in part, that's because he really starts to worry about globalization. And he's a huge proponent of free trade and globalization. But a couple of years into it, it kind of dawns on him, like, the low-skilled American worker is now in a global competition, and our schools are not very good. And additionally, where you're born ties you into a school, ties you into opportunity, ties you into your life path, and therefore the, the sort of biggest injustice is being born in a place with a school that's not very good and you can't afford to go anywhere else. So he and Rose will eventually leave the money that they have to School Choice Foundation. So, so that really becomes part of this larger political economy where you try to think of like, what is the biggest structural problem um, in capitalism? And is that not everyone is able to participate in and compete in markets on anything like an equal basis in education? He comes to believe is that, and solution. I know I interviewed him fifty years after the essay where he first talked about school choice, and he rhapsodized about the Rahway public schools, and I was kind of like, eh, you know, this, but um, yeah, he he really had a powerful experience where the schools he went to seemed to be he thought they were a great equalizer. Yeah, I think so. I mean, he felt like he benefited from that education, and. Um, Unfortunately, it wasn't available to everyone. I do have to say, though, just to be clear, he did also dream of a world in which all education was privatized. So he might rhapsodize about the railway public school, but also imagine a world where, you know, all education was privately provided. Yeah. Um, and talk a little bit about the negative income tax and how, how that, you know, why he fixated on that and then why that, you know, I mean, that became part of the earned income tax credit and things like that, which he was not so much a fan of. Yeah. So what I discovered in the archive, uh, you know, um, I read like it's probably 200 some boxes, you know, you just sift through and see what you're going to find. And eventually I found early on in my research that is called a proposal for a guaranteed minimum income. And I found a couple versions of this and I was sort of like, I wonder why Friedman has this paper. And I kept reading and then I was like, wait a second. Freeman wrote this paper, you know, and I was like, what? And so actually it happened in New York. He apparently met Gunnar Myrtle. I don't know where or how, somewhere in- uh, Who shared the Swedish economist, very lefty, shared the Nobel Prize under complaint or protest with Friedrich Hayek. Right. And um, who was very well known in, in later years for an American dilemma. This is a study of American race relations. And so somehow they meet, they get to talking- and they decide that some type of minimum income is this like great policy. So Friedman writes his first proposal. And then when he turns up at Mont Pelerin, you know, eight years later, he's also like banging the drum for you know, his universal basic income. And basically the idea he he as he sees it is this is he calls it compatible with the liberal polity because um, it would be sort of counter cyclical. You would get it when when you needed it, um, and he basically sees it as giving people a way to get into markets without compromising their individual choice. And so, as opposed to having, and you also have to remember, this is the era of very intrusive welfare programs. I mean, they're still intrusive in different ways, but you know, if the welfare inspector came to your home and you were an unmarried woman who had children and you were being supported and they saw a hat, a man's hat in the house, you could lose your benefit, you know? So the very kind of snooping and prying. So he envisions this welfare system in which you'll just be provided with cash and you'll make your own decisions about how to use it. And you'll figure out, you know, what is a basic social minimum that people need? So, so he's very fond of that idea and he eventually supports it through and decides it should run through the tax system 
And in the 60s, it's very widely discussed. And he'll make some modifications to say, you know, we, you have to be careful of the benefits cliff and maybe you want to have a work, you know, reward income more. But he says a lot of the same things that sort of today's proponents of UBI will say um, about its potential, you know, efficacy. He um, had an abiding respect for the little people. Right. Like he really thought that virtually anybody would, you know, given some freedom, would make good choices or better choices than other people could make in their lives. Um, where did that come from? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think he's just very optimistic. Um, and I think we also, in a way, when you kind of step back, you might not think of him as this sort of like quintessential 60s figure, but he kind of is. He's kind of sticking it to the man, you know? <laughs> like, he kind of wants everyone to be free, fly their freak flag. You know, yeah, he yeah. has some of that. He's very freaky. Yeah. <laughs> and he also decides over time, you know, he, he wants to be a supporter of capitalism, but he doesn't want to have any kind of social Darwinist, kind of the strong make it and the weak fall by the wayside. So hence his interest in, you know, whether it's UBI or, or school choice. But um, he needs another grounding for capitalism. And he eventually decides it's freedom. And that's kind of the central value. And so once he latches onto that, it just, you know, becomes more and more important. Right. And the first version of that uh, kind of as a big text is the book he wrote with Rose's uh, assistance, Capitalism and Freedom. Yes. He sees them as mutually reinforcing and then later free to choose. Um, it's all about giving people more ability and not only to make choices, but to actually be able to participate. Yeah. Um, talk about his role in ending the military draft. Okay, so that's another interesting one. Um, so again, think of like Milton Friedman as the quintessential 60s figure. He's very much against the draft. And he, again, sees that as like a straightforward violation of individual rights, that the state has some type of ownership claim on you. He just philosophically objects to that, very much in the way that Ayn Rand did. He's very different, though, from F.A. Hayek and von Mises, who basically are like, coming out of the European experience, sometimes you need an army quick. And so we should still keep conscription. That's that's kind of a divide. Um, and so he does a couple things. One is he, by this point, is a really big figure in the culture. And so he is able to talk about ending the draft. And he's like a Republican economics professor. He's very respectable. So he kind of shifts the politics away from the kind of hippie, long hair, you know, um, left-leaning vibe. And interestingly, Buckley also supports it. And Nixon is, again, the one who will push the policy through. So it, it actually does have a lot of conservative support. Um, and then he also will, um, you know, support this analysis, which basically says, the number one argument against a draft is from the military uh, who like the way things are and who say it's going to be way too much money. This is how they just basically say we can't even consider it. And so Freeman comes and says, look, sure, you're looking at one sticker price, which is the cost of paying your soldiers, but you're not looking at the, the unseen cost, right? The seen and the unseen. The unseen cost is you're taking – a huge swath of your, you know, men out of the labor force in their most productive years. So he kind of reorients it to this other metric, but he also makes it about kind of costs and benefits. And there's a moral piece, but that's not really what he leads with. Now, the other thing, and maybe I'm wrong about this, so let me know if you find it. It could not find Milton Friedman saying anything about the Vietnam War and his thoughts on the Vietnam War. He managed to lead this public campaign against the military draft without commenting on the war. And so this, to me, was just stupendous um, that he Is was— Is that because he didn't have an opinion, which seems hard to believe? Or he it just seems felt hard to believe. I think he just felt like the most important thing I can do right now is end the draft. And if I sidetrack into a debate on the war, I will lose, like— the message that I have. Yeah, um, and you point out in the book, uh, it's deeply uh, touching, actually, that he relied on an economic, a cost-benefit analysis put together by a Japanese-American mm -hmm. who had, whose family had been interned in World War II, and that helped end the draft. That just is a beautiful kind of symmetry. Yeah, one of his students, Walter Oy, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's also amazing how quickly the draft ramped up during the 60s from several thousand a year to 400,000 uh, 
a year, I think, in 1966, you point out. So this is gigantic. Um, let's talk about Chile before mm -hmm. we go to, uh, to well, one more question. But Chile, why, um, why is uh, Milton Friedman tied so tightly with the Pinochet regime, which was a repressive, uh, tyrannical regime that ultimately you know, uh, after that period was over, Chile was for many years the uh, the, the kind of best performing economy in Latin America. But what did Friedman do? And is it right to link him to the Pinochet regime? Yeah, it's an interesting question because he didn't spend very much time in Chile. So the, the kind of story starts with um, the United States government funding um, students to come and study from Chile at the University of Chicago, which was part of a broader kind of effort to spread American ideas during the Cold War. And so this group of students, it's eventually about 100, is trained at Chicago. Only one of them is actually Friedman's doctoral student, but they take classes with him and they kind of get the whole Chicago um, set of economic ideas. And they go back to Chile and they really um, are a minority, to say the least, because Chile is following import substitution industrialization, ISI, which creates a very large role for the state and its protectionist in order to nurture domestic industries. And, um, you know, big companies and, and the state are very much intertwined. And the, these, uh, Chicago, they're called the Chicago Boys, which is pejorative. Um, and so they want to do, you know, sort of neoclassical economics, foreign policy, free markets, free prices, you know, open trade. They really get nowhere. Um, Eventually, it's in I think it's in 1973 that um, Salvador Allende, who's a socialist Marxist, is elected, and then three years later, I might be getting my exact dates wrong. I think it's 70, 70, 70, 70 He's elected. Seventy three. He's overthrown by um, Pinochet in a military coup. It's, it's bloody. It's violent. Um, and there's just a, gr a great deal of upheaval during the Allende regime and afterwards. And so when um, Pinochet comes into power, the inflation rate in Chile is 600% a year. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of macroeconomic crisis and a political crisis wrapped in one. And then um, a year in, they've gotten the inflation down about 300%, but he's still having a lot of problems. And it's at that point that the Chicago boys <clears throat> have really been off stage for most of us are able to come and get into the regime and say, look, we have a wholly different way to do this. We have a different set of approaches. Let's do that. And as, as they're getting, you know, this policy considered, they basically call Friedman and they say, can you come and can you talk about um, what we should do to like how we should manage the economy, how we can address inflation? So Friedman decides to come. He spends six days in the country. He meets a lot of, um, you know, sort of members of the Chilean state, he meets Pinochet. He tells him, you should tackle inflation. I mean, you have to do basically a shock treatment. <clears throat> you have such bad inflation. You can't wait. You can't be a gradualist. He's a gradualist in the United States, but not in this hyperinflation situation. So then, um, and he also tells Pinochet, if you open the economy the way you will, you want to, eventually you're going to have to liberalize. Um, and from the accounts we have, Pinochet is basically like, isn't this going to cause too much social pain and disruption? And Friedman says, you, you kind of have no choice. And that's the message he gives to the country more broadly. And so I have, I found a travel log where he writes all his, uh, like he, the few days after he got back from Chile, he wrote all this down. So I have a really good sense of what his impressions were. We can't be exactly sure of what he said because it's a censored press, but most of his talks were like pretty boring, like, um, you know, monetary policy. At any rate, that is the policy that's put in place. Um, and so Friedman really puts his kind of imprimatur on the mar market-based reforms. And he doesn't view this as advising, you know, a politician with whom he's aligned. It's, it's not as if he agreed to be on the Council of Economic Advisors of Pinochet because he supports his plan. You know, he's done, it's, it's the context is American economists flying around the world, telling socialist countries, like, become more capitalist, right? It's a pretty common, uh, common move. And so then he leaves, and a couple, it's, it's not too long after that one of Pinochet's leading opponents, who's in exile in the United States, is assassinated. By He's, Pinochet. By Pinochet. Agents, uh, yeah. uh, you know, they have this kind of secret police. It, in a car bomb on the streets of Washington, D.C., it's completely shocking. And then just a couple weeks later, Friedman gets awarded the Nobel. 
And the man who was assassinated was quite critical of Friedman and, and interpreted Friedman as a supporter of Pinochet and even thought he was part of the kind of architect of the coup. So then he's assassinated. Then the Nobel Prize happens. So the result is just this all gets mixed together and it comes to seem as if the Nobel Prize Committee and the sort of industrialized West has decided to approve and endorse the Pinochet regime. And, and so that's really a framing that's put on it um, by, uh, you know, Chilean exiles um, and who are very angry with Friedman and feel like he should just have steered clear of the country entirely. So it becomes um, just a real it's a real controversy. It's very painful for Friedman. And over time, he'll realize he has to speak out more forcefully about political freedom. You know, his remarks previous to that are really all about economic freedom. And eventually he kind of realizes, I have to talk about political freedom too. So you'll see a shift. Um, one more thing I would say that you and I chatted about briefly offline is that, you know, Friedman doesn't come out in support of the regime, but there are some other... Um, uh, you know, economists, most notably F.A. Hayek, who offer more justifications and defenses of the regime. And I think in the kind of public memory, Friedman gets kind of lumped into that. Um, and so it's all seen as this endorsement of a military government. And Friedman's really horrified. He's like, I, I didn't ever perceive that going there to give my advice you know, I'm the world expert on inflation. There's 300% hyperinflation. Like, of course, I'm going to go and say, here's what I think should be done. That, that doesn't mean I support Pinochet. So he's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult period for him. Why do you think that um, slag against him has, you know, been so long lived though? Some of it I just think is misinformation. You know, there's there's a belief that the the coup was done in the service of this particular set of economic ideas, um, and, and so I that's kind of like Naomi Klein's uh, in her shock doctrine book. Yeah, there's some docu without. documentaries where it's seen that like this was all sort of part of a master plan, and that. Um, it was necessary to, you know, people were so committed to capitalism that they needed an autocratic government to sort of force it on the country. So, um, I mean, it's it's sort of an inverse narrative of the connection between socialism and, you know, authoritarian regimes. And so I think it has some powers being an inversion of that. Um, so I guess my hope is that with more information on what happened, we can have this sort of like a better understanding of it. And is that kind of that connection? Is that the origin of when Friedman really started to talk about how when you get economic freedom, political freedom comes trailing along? Yeah, I think so. What happened was then so this is like 75. He goes to Chile. 76 is the Nobel Prize. And then the Mont Pelerin Society has its meeting. I think it's a regional meeting in like 1981, which again is interpreted as like this is an endorsement. And Freeman's really worried about that. And he actually gets some, there was a, an economist who was in the government and he gets him disinvited to the meeting because he doesn't want to feel like there's a connection. And at this meeting, Chileans are starting to say, um, mimic the leftist line that like, we only got capitalism because we had a strong government. And like, we needed that strong government to get capitalism. And Friedman's like, no, 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 no. This is not how it works. And he starts kind of pushing back more. Um, I think he's also trying to push back against Hayek and yeah. then talk more. And I think, you know, for most of his career, he's in American academia and he's taking political freedom for granted. And he's thinking, my peers need to focus more on economic freedom. And then he gets out into the world and it's like, oh, you know, maybe I need to be talking about political freedom first because these two are intertwined. Let's have some questions. Sir, your question, make it a question if we will have a withering glare. I, I'm, a, I'm an economic journalist who had about 20 conversations with Milton Friedman over the years. And you're going to tell us about each one. Including a month, <laughs> yes. Okay. Including, including a month before he died, and uh, I may well quote you in the book. Well, I have to look should. at the footnotes. And <laughs> the uh, the I question. Had, I had a debate with I had a recent debate with David Friedman, and that point you make about David and his family is just hilarious. I embarrassed him a bit about that. 
Uh, but uh, that aside, I loved your book because I loved Milton Friedman. But of course, given my intimate knowledge of this guy, by the way, if you called him up, there was no answering machine. It would just ring for 20 times. Uh, but, to okay, the I'll, question. I'll get to my question in a second. But then also, <laughs> also, I want to budget to your point. I think you do make the point, because screw Nick, I think you do make the point hmm. that, that Milton Friedman also advised the Chinese, and nobody holds him responsible for the authority. And he also talked yeah. to Tito in Yugoslavia. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. talks to people, and they don't blame him for that. But that aside, I, I do want to go at you for uh, that classic point. The, the one thing when Milton Friedman insulted me the most was when he started to talk about the drug laws. And mm -hmm. I and actually, I think it might... I'm, Best of my recollection, you don't mention that. When he got started on the drug laws in my 20 conversation with him, boy, would he, he wanted a complete abolition of the drug laws. Mm -hmm. and of course, his famous statement was that, look, my fundamental objection is that the government has no more right to tell me what I put in my mouth as it tells me to, uh, to, to what comes out of my mouth. And, and you yourself have said, and he also said, of course, that a government that, that, pu that pushes freedom will get more equality as well. And then on top of that, uh, you've just reminded me that, I, that he not only wanted school choice, he really wanted the government out of schools. You, would you like me to okay. comment on the drug legalization? I, you question? know, I, I'm not sure that he would, but why? let's talk about the drug, yeah, the role you, of the you, drug war. You just made the point that he also wanted the schools out of schooling, the government out of schooling altogether. So that's why we libertarians, and then you yourself said he wanted a rollback of about 60% of government expenditures. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would say okay. that's very liberal. So do you want to roll that up into a single question? Yes. Why didn't you call the book, the subtitle, One of the Great Nights of Libertarianism? Okay. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'll take that under consideration for the sequel. Thank okay. you. <laughs> um, would you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, drug laws? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the commenter has summed up how that is really part of Friedman's worldview mm -hmm. and that freedom and kind of liberationist mm -hmm. ethos. Um, yeah, so I think he he very much saw that as part of, and again, I think also Buckley also supported legalization, mm, you know, to yeah. some degree. Squishy. I, I don't, I don't know what Friedman would make if you walked him down the streets in San Francisco mm -hmm. and said, this is what it actually looks like. I mean, he tended to stick to his principles through thick and thin. So maybe he would stick with it, but I think we just saw Oregon, Portlandia mm -hmm. starting to take a step back from that when they see what it looks like. Did, so. um, maybe as a, a follow-up, did uh, Friedman, how would you um, talk about his change over time? Because did he, he became, he never became an anarchist. His son David Friedman is an anarcho-capitalist or helped popularize that. Um, did he become more of, uh, more libertarian or more of a minimal government? Yeah, guy. I think he did. And I think some of that is evolution and some of that is changing context. Mm -hmm. So I think the Nixon administration was really a watershed moment for him because he saw how much the state grew under Republican. Mm -hmm. And it also coincided with his discovering of public choice and kind of right. really buying into that. And I think he concluded, look, the dynamic of government is growth. It just grows. And so therefore, I've got to push back harder than I thought in order to restrain it. And so I think, you know, maybe if there had, if the government hadn't grown as much as it did over the, the federal state over the course of the 20th century, he wouldn't have shifted. But he really did shift. So he becomes much more anti-government as he comes into, he just gets sharper, you know, that kind of early Chicago ethos fades a bit. I think it's part of its popularization. You know, when he's in Free to Choose, he has to really simplify, you know. So you get the monetary history is like the government caused the Great Depression, which it's not really what the monetary history is really saying in mm -hmm. the round. But then what I hadn't expected is in the last like five or so years of his life, he gets reflective and he talks about a lot of the things he got wrong. And so, so even though he gets a little bit more, he, it's almost like he gets a little bit more rigid and then he kind of relaxes and opens up a little bit in the last years of his life. All right. Next question. Yeah, thanks. I was curious about Friedman's kind of engagements with people on other parts of the right to him. So you mentioned the conservative tradition, whether he read people like Russell Kirk or, you know, 
So that on the one side, and then more radical libertarians than him, right? The free banking folks and so on. So two parts. Yeah, question. good question. So the first letter he ever wrote to William F. Buckley was is co-signed with Aaron Director, and they were criticizing an article by Russell Kirk that in turn criticized the Mont Pelerin Society and and Friedman kind of said, young man, you know, kind of wagged his finger at Buckley. Russell Kirk was never a young man. <laughs> <laughs> no, Buckley was the young yeah. man who ah, had given you. him the given yeah. him the the platform. So um so he didn't he tended it's sort of like he avoided talking about the Vietnam War. He tended to avoid the kind of social and religious issues. And as they rose up into prominence, he really didn't comment much about them. You know, he he knew what he wanted to focus on. In terms of the anarcho-capitalists, I mean, I think David was a real connection to that community. And I think he would say, he might have said something like, I wish I could be an anarchist, but I don't, I can't go all, you know, he just sort of fundamentally thought it wasn't um, practical. I, I imagine as a, you know, a Jewish man growing up in the 20th century, he feared anarchy a bit as well. And finally, on the banking, I mean, if you look at the Chicago teaching, it's like it, it, the state and money are just they're intrinsically tied. And Friedman thought even if you let a thousand flowers bloom and had all these competing currencies, eventually people would converge on one and you would basically recreate state money. So thank you. Could you question. very quickly, uh, what was his relationship with Ayn Rand like? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Ayn Rand called him a communist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, to be fair, that's uh, kind of how she said hello. Right? Yes. <laughs> And, you know, his quote on her was, um, a very unpleasant woman who did a great deal of good, I think. Um, and so there was a moment when the objectivists kind of took over the new individualist review, which was headquartered at Chicago, and they started, like, heckling him and really making life. So he was like, what is happening? And then he figured out, oh, these are Randians. So, um, again, he tried to just appreciate her as someone who would get people interested in these ideas. But, yeah, I mean, they were all very different people. Yeah. Uh, next question, please. So, following up on that last question, there, there were, there are also uh, some macroeconomic schools of conservative thought that differ from Friedman, uh, but are very influential and concurrent with them. For instance, the supply siders, you know, arguing about the centrality of good supply side tax policy, and then you have the free traders who argue that, for instance, the Smoot Hawley tariff mm -hmm. was the real cause of the Great Depression and explains why it was a worldwide phenomenon and how this tariff wars caused everything. So, how did how did Friedman interact with those other macro theories? Uh, that were extremely influential and all, you know, came together in Reaganomics, but he was only one third of that pie. But what yeah. do you think of those other two thirds that were so influential? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So with supply side, he was suspicious of it. And there's some early arguments where he's like, you know, sure, there's so, and this is specifically the supply side idea that um, if you lower tax rates, you will get more tax revenue because the lowering of tax rates will stimulate the economy. And he said, sure, that will be the case in some cases. I don't think it will work system-wide, but I support it anyhow because lowering tax revenue will, uh, the, governor, the government won't be able to do as much. So he really makes this like strategic endorsement of supply side when it comes to taxation. Um, he doesn't, he, he's not a believer in going back to the gold standard. And, and to the extent that that's part of supply side, he won't even have the conversation. He, you know, the Austrians, he doesn't like that either. He, he's, he's always in a running debate with other libertarians who want to go back to gold from the like 1940s mm -hmm. on. And he will never, he, he really doesn't count as that all the way to Schwartz basically, you know, putting in the same kind of the nail in the coffin in the Gold Commission in he, 1982. He also believed, uh, he was fond of saying that the ultimate measure of the state was how much it spent. He seemed to believe that governments would not deficit spend. Um, and he, you know, starting with Reagan at the very least, seemed to be way off on that. Yeah, I mean, so the same place where he endorses supply side, um, there's another, you know, he says, well, the, the Reagan administration, of course, will be fiscally responsible. Oh. And then he argues, you know, deficits aren't bad unless they're inflated away. 
and they won't do that. And also the deficit won't get that bad because they'll be responsible. So, so he's part of that shift to legitimating deficits. And in part, that's because he sort of hasn't seen anything yet. He thinks the spending is going to be restrained. And then eventually by the eighties, like he's a team player, you know? And so he's not, he's not going to waste a lot of time on friendly fire. You know, he's going to, he's going to try to minimize differences and accentuate, um, agreement. Uh, next question, please. Um, could you talk a little bit about the impact that Friedman had on Asia and in particular his relationship with Hong Kong, where I'm from? And is it true, this is what I heard, this is afraid in Hong Kong, that our move away from free markets is what killed him. Is that true? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, great. That's a conspiracy theory I could mm. do something with. I'm pretty sure that he died of natural causes at 94. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he did. He he admired and was really interested in Hong Kong as kind of a laboratory of of capitalism. Um, he was very optimistic on China. He went several. I think he went in the fifties. He went in the seventies. He went in the eighties. And when he saw Tiananmen Square, he thought this is the beginning of the end. This is that of, dynamic of the Chinese regime of the Chinese the regime, regime that the Chinese regime has liberalized its economy, mm-hmm. and eventually the dominoes will fall and it will have to liberalize its society. So he said, eventually there'll be more Tiananmen's. And, and again, he has this great object lesson in Chile because in 1980, Chile is a plebiscite to go back to democracy and they transition to democracy around 1989. So he's seen an example of it. He thinks it will work. Um, and yeah, he was not right about that yet. Um, and in general, when he started looking more at Asian economic development in the later part of his life, that's when he started talking about, so he's always talked about political freedom, economic freedom. He starts talking about civic freedom. And I think this is inspired by Singapore, maybe to some degree Hong Kong, this idea that you could um, meet, you could have meetings, maybe even a little bit of a protest, but you didn't have democratic choice. And that to him was civic freedom. And so he was trying to find he was trying to identify another type of regime in which it wasn't there wasn't like a secret police or a repressive state apparatus, but you didn't have democratic choice. You had limited freedoms and you had economic freedom. And he's kind of trying to figure out how that all fit together. But again, he's made a couple trips to these countries and he's trying to kind of fit them in his schema. He didn't have any particularly deep knowledge of that region of the world. And next question. Yes, so I think uh, as successful as Friedman was in an academic context, writing all the journal articles, writing, uh, coming up with his theory of inflation, history of monetary history in the United States, I think what sets him apart in a lot of ways is his ability to communicate these ideas to a broader audience, to people who are less economically literate. Things like Capitalism and Freedom or um, Free to Choose, the TV series, right? So what made him so unique in his ability to do this? And what are some of the lessons we can learn today when trying to communicate some of those same ideas? Um, uh, excellent question. My one word answer is Rose. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and so find, find a, good, a good partner. But I do, I, I say that in jest, but the, the books of his, so for monetary history really transcended just economics and also so did Free to Choose and... Um, Capitalism, uh, and, capitalism freedom. and freedom. They ha- they both had. They all had women co-authors, and I think what that did was it wouldn't necessarily have to happen because they were women, but they had a different intellectual orientation. So Schwartz was more of a historian, interested in narrative, kind of grounding these really abstract ideas in stories that people could relate to, and likewise, Rose would help him work out his Newsweek columns, and then she would kind of prime him off stage before he got in front of the camera and talked. So I think he he wasn't just an economist and he wasn't just immersed in other people who were, they were professional economists, but they had brought other intellectual skills. So I think it's something about that. And I also do think like history and narrative and story are just really this, how humans communicate and share ideas and those can't be forgotten. It's uh, really fascinating, the discussion of how he how he worked on Free to Choose, where he he had some notes, but, you know, like Jackie Gleason, he didn't like to rehearse. But but Rose would kind of put him through his paces. Yeah, correct get him warmed him. up a little bit. And she did that with his Newsweek column. Yeah, and, uh, and apparently he really wasn't sure 
about doing the Newsweek column. You know, he's busy, right? And so apparently she and David like tag teamed him for like 48 hours and were like, you got to do this. Um, so he had, he had a support team. I mean, that's another big lesson is one reason he achieved so much is that he had a lot of other people helping him intellectually behind the scenes. And then he also plugged into all these networks, you know, which I describe in the book and we haven't really touched on here, but he had lifelong friends that were also committed to the same causes as he was. So, and he was pretty generous in, uh, you know, he, he didn't pretend that he was a universal genius work. Yeah. He was like the anti Rand in that he, he gave a lot of credit to other people. Yes. Compared to Rand, he was yeah. quite generous. Yeah. Um, which is <laughs> the most scathing indictment of a human you could say, right? But okay. Um, just before my question, I needed to point out that Friedman did in multiple places advocate for abolishing the Federal Reserve. And even in 1984, yeah. he writes a paper where he sketches a proposal for phasing out the Federal Reserve and re allowing free banking to take its place. So he did even go that far at, at some point in his career, later part. My question is that um, throughout his career, he advocated for the idea, especially in the late 70s and onward, of a constitutional amendment to limit total government spending. Mm -hmm. And it even went somewhere in the 1980s when the Reagan administration, and the Republicans tried to get it passed in Congress. Uh, so could you talk about his efforts there too? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and just on the, on the first point is interesting in the beginning when he would appear before Congress, he would still tout 100% money. You know, this is in the early 60s. And then eventually over time, he's like, well, you should have a monetary growth rule, you know? And so I think he... He kind of realized if you show up to Congress and say, rip up your banking system, root and branch, no one's going to listen to you. But if you say, well, here's my kind of technical tweak, then you then you get somewhere. Um, so the second part of the question was about, sorry, refresh my memory. Uh, about the constitutional amendment to limit oh, yeah. overall government expenditure. I mean, I think this is where he, this is what he took from public choice theory and whether it was an actual constitution or just another kind of rules-based framework. So... Um, such as many states passed, which would either be like a balanced budget amendment or a supermajority for um, a tax raise or setting like capping property taxes. That was very promising to him because it get, goes back to rules over discretion. You set up a new rule and a structure and then the politician can't change it or it's more difficult for them to change it. So instead of kind of lobbying and being trying to influence the decision makers, you kind of change the, the setting in which decisions are made. So I would say he, he was involved in these state level organizations. It's actually what he was doing when he um, won the Nobel Prize. I think he was in Michigan and the Michigan mm -hmm. organizers, they had Friedman out and they're like, God, this is going so great. Like, look at all the media here. Like, our cause is really great. And then they're like, oh, Friedman won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> like, yeah. that's why they're all here. So that was very important to him, for sure. Next question. Well, this was alluded to a bit earlier, a couple of times, but uh, to how well did uh, Hayek and the distinctly anti-positivist Austrians get along with uh, the monitorist school, Friedman and the entire Chicago school? Yeah, I think there was a lot of mutual suspicion, but also a lot of effort to kind of bury the hatchet. Um, so, you know, Hayek is really pushing back while he's at Chicago. And it's hard because while they're together and interacting the most, you don't have the most, you can't really see into that relationship. But um, Hayek thought any type of monetary growth rule was, simply, was inflation, simply put. So he's very suspicious of that. And then, um, so he's kind of, you know, he's kind of always at them as they are kind of reformulating monetarism in the 1950s. Then later, you know, he's really emerging as the, trying to be the opposite of Friedman in terms of like in Britain, we should do more of a shock treatment versus gradualism. Um, and so I think there's tension there. And I think Hayek regretted maybe not um, there's a couple of places where he's like, I wish I had like discredited Friedman or I wish I had pushed back against Friedman more. But at the same time, they do perceive themselves as being in some sort of alliance. And so they're better than some other political movements at kind of keeping those disagreements more quiet rather they're, than. They're both very, I mean, very clearly and broadly liberal in a, a 19th and early 20th century sense. Yeah. So they're they're on the same side pushing back against 
things like central planning and all of that kind of stuff. And I think, yeah, but the, the money is a, a point of difference, mm -hmm. like how they would manage, whether it's the gold standard or banking or free banking, they never quite come together on that. But again, you know, Hayek, Hayek goes through many different stages. So you have to kind of figure out which Hayek is the one we're, we're talking about. I like Salma Hayek. <laughs> uh, now, and there is a real distinction between the positivism and the, the kind of Austrian understanding, which really approximates postmodernism. We won't go into that. Thank you. Ne uh, next and final question. Um, it seems like similar to Chile, uh, a lot of students uh, from Chicago um, came to Brazil to lead part of the monetary revolution, um, combating hyperinflation. But um, from uh, what I understand, it seemed like Friedman was not very um, a big fan of the plan itself, and it felt like it wasn't going far enough because there was still a big fiscal deficit in Brazil. And I, mm -hmm. I guess from what I understood, um, his position on the IMF saw that uh, the IMF was subsidizing a lot of the fiscal deficits around the globe, including Brazil. So I was just wondering what was your uh, if, if you could give us any more color on his uh, position on the IMF and his involvement or his students involvement in the monetary revolution in Brazil yeah that's a great question I wish I could say more about Brazil but I cannot um, but I do know that he and George Schultz called for the abolition of the IMF and the World Bank and um, they, for this reason that you sort of mentioned, they thought it created these moral hazard or kind of perverse incentives that it was easy to spend other people's money mm -hmm. and that they basically had kind of juiced the development process beyond what it could sustain. Um, and they also, so this, this became for Friedman sort of emblematic of how when I talked about his belief that the dynamic of government is growth, that once an organization or a bureaucracy is created, it just finds a way to sustain itself. And he saw these as created during the time of Bretton Woods to kind of sustain the Bretton Woods monetary system. And then Bretton Woods ended and they kind of reinvented themselves as sort of global development agencies. And he thought this was really problematic and they should just be, um, they should just be abolished. So he and George Schultz who had been the secretary treasury, so they had this kind of like a bunch of co-authored, a couple op-eds. Didn't really go anywhere, but it's interesting because it has this sort of echo with the anti-WTO movements, mm -hmm. you know? So you have that kind of left, left, right synergy. A kind of horseshoe, a good yeah, horseshoe a, theory. A, yeah, potential horseshoe. And he was friendly with Schultz. They were both on the faculty at Chicago. Yeah, and that's a, a relationship I talk about when the relationship with Arthur Burns collapses, he and George Schultz become extremely close. And that's one of the ways Friedman proved so influential in the Nixon administration is through the kind of the evolution of Bretton Woods or the last days of Bretton Woods. And really Schultz is kind of his man on the inside. Do you think that Milton Friedman would have invested it or lent his credibility to Theranos? Yeah. <laughs> like George <laughs> Schultz did? Did he have any big, you know, stupid investments? Uh, you know, actually, I apparent I I don't I did not find they did not yeah. put their like balance sheet in the archive, so I don't know. And that's but, really Rose, right? I mean, she talked. She was paying all the bills, right? Yeah, she yeah. was writing all the checks. So. I mean, they ended up having a pretty nice life, so I think they made some good investments. But they also got in early and just stayed in, and it was yeah. the American century, you know. I so. guess as a final question, um, what do you think uh, Friedman would have made of Javier Malay in Argentina, oh, who I think, I think did, like, named one of his cloned <laughs> dogs after? Milton Friedman. Yeah, I think he'd be really, really excited. Um, I mean, I think he would, so Ayn Rand would not be able to set aside the parts of Malay that are more socially conservative. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think Friedman might notice the populism, but I think would focus more on the idea that this is a really straightforward cure for the ills that mm -hmm. Argentina has been suffering for, you know, for so long. And so I think he would say, if he does it right, it's going to have a trajectory like Chile, you know, in terms of developing a really strong economy. So I think he'd be very excited. And I think, yeah, I mean, Millet sounds like he's in a Chicago economic seminar when he lays out, you know, his, his ideas. So I think he'd be thrilled. Yeah, uh, Robert Lucas is one of his dogs as well. I think it's like, it might be Mises, <laughs> I Rothbard, missed that. And I Lucas. heard Rothbard, Mises, yeah, and it's like, Friedman, okay, yeah. and Lucas. Yeah, I don't yeah. know about... Yeah, Friedman and Lucas, a little different. I always thought that uh, libertarians <laughs> like cats more than dogs, but I, I guess not, right? Um, I want to thank Jennifer Burns for talking to Reason. Uh, the book 
The book is Milton Friedman, The Last Conservative. Thank you so much for talking. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out.